business and doing business in Asia. In 2011, Mr. Crosby departed MBS to take on the role as Dean of School of Global Management in Singapore before returning to MBS in late 2012. Mr. Crosby is a regular commentator at, in the Australian Finance Financial Review and the H newspapers, as well as on ABC News Breakfast and other media. Before we start our power talk, we would like to inform you several important information. The first one is IPRL is a smoke-free campus, therefore smoking activity is not allowed anywhere within our campus area. Restrooms are available at each floor, and on this floor, the restrooms are available on your right side. In case of emergency, please leave the room immediately and proceed to the exit using the stairwell. Elevators cannot be used during emergency. Kindly spend some time to fill in our evaluation form after the event so that we can improve and serve you better. I3L provides scholarships for students whose parents work in pharmaceutical and life science related companies. For more information, you are welcome to contact our marketing department. Lastly, you are welcome to enjoy the coffee and snacks provided just outside of this room. Before we start our discussion, I would like to invite Professor John Novella as our COO and Executive President of I3L to give a welcoming speech. Professor John Nwala is going to be our moderator for today's event as well. Please welcome Professor John Nwala. So good afternoon everyone. Good afternoon. I hope you are as excited as I am to hear the wisdom from Professor Mark Cosby. I just want to share with you about five minutes a little background for our talk today. Might be too echoing in the mic here. So, I had the pleasure of knowing Melbourne Business School and Professor Mark Crosby, I think, from around 2012, if I remember, Mark. The times we go back to when we start to work together in Indonesia, together with Ibuena. And in that time, we have heard lots of things from Prof. Mark about economic aspects of China and its role it's playing in the regional as well as I would say in the global scene. China is a superpower at the moment and will always be in the coming future. Today, I just have the pleasure of a little bit moderating this session and then also in facilitating some questions after. I want to first start by why we meet today in a forum like this. I feel it's a very different type of academic institute. Most of you who have been with us before probably know. Our goal is not just to produce certificates and graduates, rather to have well-rounded students with industry, international community, students, faculty, and our friends come together and play a role of what we call thought leadership, which means playing a part of where Indonesia is heading tomorrow. And that's the kind of forum here, which is also the practical relevance of any academic institute. We call it rigor and relevance. The depth of the learning and its ability to apply across a wide variety of things. So we hope you keep that in mind as you go through. Those of you who are, who are new to I3L, we hope you take 15 minutes or so after the session to go around up and down to see our great facilities in the third floor or the out of the world laboratories, great facilities on the level A. I, I think our building management or park race are can take you through that, so please let us know. So here's what I want to share with you before I hand over to Prof. Mark. I just want a couple of words here. Can you see in the back? Yeah. Hopefully, yeah, all right. I just want to put here a few words. So China, USA, Australia, India, a different pen. Japan, and then surely Indonesia. I need a pen, guys. If you can get me that. You can write. 
So just a couple of quick points from my side. I've been following China in the last one week or so quite closely in anticipation of Professor Mark Crosby. And here's what I have read in the last seven days yeah, about um, these countries. Okay. So I start with the US. President Barack Obama yesterday, I think, announced one million Americans will learn the Chinese language, Mandarin. Now there's a lot of controversy about that. Are you really serious? You know, one million people? Where's the money going to come for that? And so on. But it seems that that discussion is moving to budgets, policies, and other circles in the American community, United States. We just come from U.S. You know, Chinese president just visited U.S. in a historic moment. Not long ago, before that, they had military vessels swimming around Alaska while President Barack Obama is in Alaska. Just a couple of days ago, Chinese and U.S. military planes almost hit each other. Yeah, which both countries declare as normal part of it, nothing to worry about. There's a whole lot of things going on between two of the superpowers of this world at a global level. And it is not accidental, it is not just one of them. There's a whole lot of things going on. I am sure there's an economic implication behind a lot of those reasons that USA is playing right now, about the devaluation of the currency, about the Chinese economic slowdown, and a whole lot of other things. About the uh, cyber security issues, these are the hot topics right now going. There's something going on in the US. As you know, Australia and China are big partners in many, many things. And uh, I just heard from Prof. Mark during lunch that even one of the president, prime ministers in Australia even speak Mandarin before Kevin Brown, yeah? And so on, which I didn't know myself. There's a whole lot of trade and many other things. I remember just a couple of months ago, China almost bought over the largest ever land plot to be sold in Australia which was some 500 hectares or something, a private farm. And then there was a whole lot of controversy about that. The sale didn't go through. Some of you know what I'm talking about. That would have been the largest real estate sale in the history of mankind. Yeah. We're talking about some ridiculous number of land. It didn't go through because the government intervened. So there's a whole lot of things going over there. Forgot to mention one fact here, sorry. I just read that 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Just now come out the news from CNN International about Chinese people as a race in America. In the next coming decades, the majority of the people living in the United States will be of Chinese descent, not Hispanic or Spanish speaking people. That means the demographic of the United States itself is going to be primarily Asian. So, going back to here. India. China is about to lose its position as the most populous country. And who's going to be the most populous country? India. That's going to happen in the next few years, according to all the predictions. Yeah. The policies in China are about one child policy, and a few other things are changing here as well. So, there's a whole lot of things going there. Also, there's a lot of tension between China and India, as you know, between the Himalayas the border disputes, economic discussions, and so on. Japan and China, a lot of relations and a lot of conflict, potential conflict. Japan just declared after the World War II, this is the biggest, most significant change in the Japanese politics. The Abe government just declared that they can be a military presence in Japan, which essentially means Japan could go to war with China. And that's legal. And then, I'm not going to spend much time on Indonesia. If you look at all things globally and regionally, South, you know, Asia, seas, all the issues there, there is something going on in this region, and China seems to be a very significant player in all aspects, going from political, governmental, from economical, social, and a whole heap of other things and they are here to stay. So I want to finish my part, and then hopefully we go through the questions, discussions, debates. I want to finish my part with a quote on the Facebook from Professor Aniko Anibuyenna, 
that I received a few days ago. She's really worried what I'm about to say now, right? Yeah. I wrote when Prof. Fanny Aliguena was just coming from a high level meetings in China. You know, I, I was a little bit stuck, you know, provocative, Prof. Fanny. And I said, Are the two of you iron ladies trying to conquer China? You probably remember this face. And I really like Prof. Annie's reply, and I want to end my part with what she said, is what she replied, so to speak, in my own words, yeah? She said that China is too big to conquer. It's not going to happen. It's better to collaborate and try to figure out how to survive too. She didn't use those exact words, but essentially what she meant is that you're not going to be able to conquer China. It's going to have to be a diplomatic solution and figuring out how it works. So essentially what that means from Prof. Eddie's quote is I want to leave you with the thought what President Vladimir Putin says in his country, minorities don't need Russia. Sorry, Russia doesn't need minorities. Minorities need Russia. I think it's the same thing when it comes to China. China doesn't need the minority regional small countries. The other countries need China. So I want to end up with Indonesia. Indonesia needs China, not China needs Indonesia. Thank you very much. Since John's using the whiteboard, can I wipe it off? This is the year when Indonesia's population overtakes China, so that's when you'll be able to over. That's when you'll be able to overall, uh, overall <laughs> China. Two thousand four hundred and twenty-five on current trends is when Australia's population overtakes China. We both have about eighty million people, so you know, with modern technology that you're working on in here, I'm expecting my kids to be around when Australia is a bigger country than China. But I guess that probably won't be the case for my lifetime, so we may as well assume that, uh, that China is important. Um, let me... So let me just start and tell you a little bit about my interests uh, and my sort of background in terms of China. Uh, I'm an economist, and I'm what, what economists would call a macroeconomist, but I look at the global uh, trends in, in economic growth and unemployment and inflation and things like that. Um, 15 years ago, I started to go to Hong Kong and worked in the central bank there, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. And at that time in Australia, there was very little interest in China's economy. I'm not sure about here, but very few economists in Australia were interested in China because it had very little effect on local regional economies. Obviously in Hong Kong, they understood that China was rising and was going to have a very significant effect, and so they were asking me and other researchers to look at the implications of the rise of China. So that started me getting me interested in China's economy. Uh, and then for the past 10 years, I've taken our students to China on study tours to understand the business and economic environment. And I've done that uh, four times every year, uh, so 40 times in the last 10 years, I've taken uh, groups of uh, between 30 and 85 students to mostly Shanghai, but Shanghai, Beijing. Uh, only left one behind. He, he uh, is unfortunately uh, very ill with Guillain-Barre syndrome. That's something I'm sure you need to work on while, while you're uh, in the lab seat. Um, but uh, in those study visits, we've looked at the business environment and the economic environment. Um, you'd be interested to know that uh, from next year, I'm no longer going to be going to China four times a year. I'm still going to be going there once or twice on study tours. But we're going to start moving our study tours into Jakarta. Yay! Yay. Now, why Yay. would I do that? Why would I move the study tours from China to Jakarta, from China to Jakarta? Why do you think I might do that? <laughs> the end of China, the time is finished. Growth rate, so that's one thing, right? So, the, I mean, from our perspective, it's, it's about opportunity. And Jakarta, Indonesia is about where China was 10 or 15 years ago in terms of 
economic um, GDP per capita and some of the economic indicators. Uh, that's, that's one reason. To be honest, there's a second reason which you probably wouldn't guess, and that is that it's getting more and more challenging and difficult to do business and do these things in, in China. I think it's always been challenging and difficult, but it's uh, becoming a little bit more so for, for political and other reasons. Not that Jakarta isn't challenging and uh, difficult, I'm sure, to, to do these trips, but I'm looking forward to spending a lot more time here over the next uh, few years. Okay, so let me talk about China, its, its economy, and, and the implications for the regional economy. Let me just uh, start with an easy question for you. Who is Indonesia's biggest export partner? China? Who agrees it's China? Well, there's a lot of whispering. You got votes. Who votes China? Only one? Two? Who votes the USA? Couple? Who votes Australia? That's a bad vote. <laughs> <laughs> India? No one? Japan? One? Indonesia can't be Indonesia's biggest trade partner. Japan is Indonesia's biggest trading partner, not China. Right? Japan has been in recession for 25 years. They haven't had any economic growth. And it's Indonesia's biggest trade partner. So Japan is not slowing down, it's slowed down, and yet Indonesia has been able to power ahead. So there's something interesting there, isn't there? Um, if you were really worried about your trade partners having to grow to be a good thing to get to the COE's 7% uh, economic growth rate by the end of this presidency, then surely Japan is more important than China. So why then is it that we think first about China and then much longer after that, Japan, and certainly a lot longer after that, Australia and these other countries. In fact, um, in terms of shares of, of Indonesia's exports, China, Japan, India are actually pretty close together. There are different things exported to those three countries. So coal, which of course is a big you know, problem for Indonesia, big problem for Australia as well, because we export a lot of it, prices are falling, and the long-term outlook doesn't look very good for environmental reasons. China is the biggest uh, host or recipient of Indonesian coal. So that's one of the reasons why we worry about China. Um, but India is a big market for palm oil and natural gas. Um, and, and Japan is, is sort of more broad-based export market for Indonesian commodities. The reason I think we worry about China uh, much more than Japan or other countries is it's the same reason from where I come from in Australia and also for Indonesia. We used to worry a lot about the United States. There's a saying in Australia that if, if the US economy catches uh, sneezes, we catch a cold. Uh, we get very sick if they just uh, tumble a little bit. Uh, and that used to be the way many countries thought about their economy. If the US got into difficulty, we were going to be in difficulty. Uh, but today, increasingly, I, I guess still we worry about the US, but other countries worry about China sneezing and them catching a cold, and especially in, in this region. And I think the reason why, even in Indonesia, it's, it's right to worry about China and its economic prospects is because even though it's not Indonesia's biggest trade partner, other trade partners of Indonesia have China as a big trade partner, in the region especially. So it, it, other other players in the region will slow down. That will help. That will hurt Indonesia uh, as well as the direct effect of, of China slowing down. So I think it is probably a much more important economy to look at than Japan or than other regional economies. And probably the only other economy which is as important is, is the United States. So that's all. Also, the introduction. Now, uh, John and Daniel were in. Melbourne um, a few weeks ago and they asked me to do a power talk and I wasn't sure if that meant that I had to speak really quickly or just power through a lot of stuff. So I assume it's both, uh, but I'll try not to speak too quickly. But I've got a long agenda there and I'm not going to cover a couple of things. But I, I want to focus on just uh, one or two things which I hope will help you understand the way China's economy works. 
and I'll focus on understanding China's reforms and then a little bit about sort of what's going on currently in financial markets. And, and I, I can come back to some of the other slides perhaps as, as we open up um, to questions. Okay, so firstly, in terms of recent volatility, so I, in the last couple of months, we've seen um, China's stock market collapse, regional stock markets collapse, exchange rates, and I know you worry here about the idea, but the reality is it should be a reasonably good thing. You were sort of worry, and I, we have a different topic I can talk about why, but the repair weakening is a, is a good thing. It's helpful for this economy. We worry about the same thing, about the Australian dollar weakening, um, but uh, it's generally a good thing for, for our economy. Um, but that weakening of regional currencies has been all about what China has been doing with its exchange rate, what's been happening with their equity market, and what's happening uh, with their economic growth. Okay, so I see headlines like this in the Financial Times. Um, China has been roiling global markets as its leaders try to stop a huge stock market bubble from bursting and its slowing economy from stalling. This is from the Financial Times in the last few weeks, I haven't got the, the date there. But you would never have seen that headline in the Financial Times three years ago, let alone 10 or 15 years ago. Um, in fact, China's equity market did exactly the same thing as it's done in the last 12 months, eight years ago, and nobody noticed. The stock market went up 700%, and then down from 7,000 to 1,000. Right, so nothing happened in global markets. It probably was in the financial times, but it wasn't on the front page. It was near the back. Right, so that's a big change in the way we perceive China. And, and here's a whole lot of sort of graphs again from the financial times that I picked up in recent weeks. Just all illustrating. Here are the connections between China and the stock market and the currency and other emerging market stocks and bonds taking a beating, including Indonesia uh, in, in the sort of among the countries here, which is feeling the heat. So we're certainly looking at, um, at the impact of China and its equity market on, on regional economies. Um, and another way of looking at that, that is that um, this is contributions to economic growth globally over the last um, uh, 10 years, or, sorry, six or seven years. Again, if I took this back further, this is from a recent Economist magazine piece. If I took this back further, the United States would be driving a third to a half of global economic growth. Now, in recent years, China has been a third to a half, and very consistently, a third to a half of global economic growth has been all about China's growth. And other emerging markets are also very, very important. So again, something that's very different in, in recent years. All right, so that's just sort of background and, and my take on why it's important to understand China. I think in terms of understanding China's economy, you have to understand the way the reform process works in China, how they're trying to reform its economy. And I, and I find this really fascinating. I think there's a lot of lessons here for Indonesia as it looks to reform or sort of grow its economy going forward, um, some lessons in how not to do things, but also a lot of lessons in how to do things. Um, so let me talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware that China's economy changed fundamentally with the, the death of Mao um, Zedong in, in 1976, and then eventually um, Deng Xiaoping took power in the late 1970s. This is interesting. I don't, I don't know why Deng chose to do what he did in 1978, but he went on a tour. Who can tell me where he went in the region? He went to three cities in the region. What were the three cities? He went to Singapore. Probably there's a connection there that still persists. He went to Singapore, Bangkok, and Kuala Lumpur. I don't know why he didn't come to Jakarta, but uh, he did. Maybe it was too far to fly or something. Yes. But, um, <laughs> He went to Singapore, he went to Bangkok, he went to Jakarta. He was, at that time, upset or, or, or not happy about the fact that it was very clear that China's economy was much poorer, in much worse shape than any of those three cities or, or, or economies. Uh, and certainly, 
miles behind Singapore in the late 1970s in terms of people's living standards and uh, just general economic well-being. And so Deng Xiaoping spent a lot of time talking to Li Kuan Yu, the recently uh, deceased uh, Singaporean leader, and, uh, and asked uh, Li Kuan Yu, how did you get your economy to get to where it is? And without going into the details, it's interesting that a lot of the early reforms in China followed what Singapore had done. And again, I think in terms of lessons for Indonesia, uh, making it very easy to do business. And they, and they set up special economic zones in China to sort of isolate those business zones from the rest of the economy, but it worked. And that was uh, what Singapore did very early on in its history as well. Um, so in terms of the general approach, the, the approach was similar to Singapore. The other thing that uh, Dan believed that was that it would be too difficult to change everything at once. So in terms of, of both economic reform and political reform, political reform has been even slower. But in terms of economic reform, the process has always been very slow reform. And there's lots of famous quotes uh, from Deng Xiaoping, and one of them which describes this process is this one of crossing the river by feeling the stones under the feet. In other words, you don't run across and then see what happens, change everything and, and, and hope for the best. But you very carefully reform, and if something doesn't work, you take a step back. And that's been very consistently the approach of Chinese government with respect to reform for the last 35 years. Yeah, if you talk about the exchange rate right now, is China going to all of a sudden liberalise capital markets, make the exchange rate totally flexible? No, they're not. That would be different to what they've done for 35 years as far as economic reform goes. They might go very slowly to that destination, to a floating exchange rate, to open capital markets, but they won't do that quickly, as, as some are suggesting that they, they should or they ought to. So that's uh, in terms of reform, the, the sort of first steps of reform were, were very gradual. The other thing that happened, uh, and this was when, after Tiananmen, was that uh, in, in 1992, Another famous uh, Deng Xiaoping quote is, uh, it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. It doesn't matter whether we're socialist or capitalist as long as we catch the mice and get something to eat. Right, so the, the constitution was changed in 1992 so that China became a market, so, uh, market socialist economy, not just socialist. So it became officially sort of capitalist. Uh, and, and so the reform process has been very gradual from very much top-down control, government ownership, to much more market orientation, but very gradual reforms across the economy. And I'll just give you an example. This is an example I, I use quite a lot, and I think it really illustrates the way reform has worked in China. I don't know who of you can read Chinese, but this is a contract, a very famous contract from a village uh, to the uh, west of Shanghai in 1978. At that time, you had collective farms. The collective farms had to produce a quota and give all of their output to the state, and they were allowed to keep it. So this contract says we're going to keep some of the excess production. And the problem with that, both the quota system, is you've got no incentive to produce more. Right? And economists know that you have to have incentives if you're going to have a, a well-functioning so that these, this village agreed that they would fulfill their required quota um, and then they would keep the excess production to themselves and distribute according to who put in more effort. So basically you're allowed to grow kind of small plot where you grow your own um, fruit, fruit, fruit and vegetables. And they agreed that no one had to tell anyone about this, but if someone got jailed, the rest of the village would look after the, 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 that person's family. Um, well, and this, this is the sort of person who was signing that contract, so not a, not a high up official, but this villager. Now the point is, ultimately, Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping found out about that contract, but instead of doing what Mao would have done, which is to say arrest them all and send them off to camps, Deng Xiaoping asked, did it work? Did the cat catch the mice? And it did work. 
they did produce more, they fulfilled the state quota. So Deng said, why don't we try that in other collective farms? And the first reforms in China were in agriculture, farmers got rich. Um, so two things arose out of that. Farmers got rich, so they're better off, and, and the countryside got richer as opposed to the cities, which has been the more recent trend. The other thing is, in having more efficient and effective farms, you're able to move workers off those farms into factories. So from the mid-1980s, you start to see, especially investors from Taiwan and Hong Kong, building factories in China and starting to produce clothes, shoes, uh, electronics, and things like that. So you need to have both of those things happen. You've got enough food now, um, and you've got a willing workforce. Uh, and if the government does things right, by creating an environment that's conducive to factories, then you can attract those factories. So that was the early reform process in, in China. And it's fascinating to me, I, I don't know if any of you have seen uh, today's Wall Street Journal, but the front page has an article about Indonesia and all of the difficulties Levi Strauss is having in, in Indonesia with, uh, with operators. And to me, this is a really critical question for the government. They have to make it easy for Levi's and companies like that to operate in Indonesia because there is a huge opportunity for Indonesia to grab 30 or 40 million jobs out of China into Indonesia. They might not sound like good jobs working in a factory in, in, for Levi Strauss, but they're the sort of jobs that get you money, that get you the money to pay for education, and that you can do what China did 15 years ago where people move up the skill chain up the, up the income chain, up the value chain. So it's critical that Indonesia kind of tries to grab those jobs. That's a huge implication for this economy. Because if Indonesia doesn't take that chance, maybe Vietnam will, or Bangladesh, or other sort of lower income countries in the region where there's, there's still relatively uh, low wages and the opportunity to, to, to grab that market share. So this is a, a really interesting uh, sort of um, analog to where we, where we sit today in terms of what happened in the past in China. Okay, so in terms of reform, I won't, I won't, I won't talk about the financial sector because I'll skip along and leave more time for questions. Other than to, to talk about the recent, um, this is just a little bit there in terms of um, financial uh, bank, banks and so on. But um, in terms of equity markets, this is what I, what I spoke about at the outset. So here is the 2006-7 big rise and big fall in, in uh, the equity market. Interestingly, it's almost exactly the same size rise, and you know, I think now we're down to about here. I'm not sure where, where the Chinese equity market is here. So this is the period where Chinese equity market went up from about a thousand to seven, nearly seven thousand, I think, on one of the indices, and back down to a little bit higher than the original level. Again, that had no implication for China's economy. China's economy grew at 8 or 9% through that period. Now we worry about this having an implication for China's economy, slowing down the economy. I still think that China's equity market is largely unrelated to what happens in China's economy. It's very unsophisticated, uh, it's not very liquid, so you don't have firms uh, uh, listing all of their shares, and, and in general there are a number of reasons why I think the equity market is not a good marker of where the, the real economy is going. However, I do think that it's right to worry about China's economic growth. So that's, um, that's just a little bit on the, on the volatility in, in the equity market. Might come back to the exchange rate at the end. Let me spend a little bit of time on this question then of China's economic growth. So I'm not quite sure why it is that the recent falls in equity markets have been sort of pointed to, uh, to weaker economic growth because the, when the equity market was going up, it wasn't like people were saying China's economy is going really well. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But I do think that there are reasons for worry about the future for China's economic growth. In terms of the past uh, 30 years, so since Deng Xiaoping started those reforms, the average economic growth rate in China has been about 10, nearly 10%. Uh, 
Uh, and, and there's some issues with the measurement of that. Some say it might only be 8%. Whatever, 8 or 10 is still very, very good. If Indonesia could get 8% economic growth for the next three decades, that's going to mean that average GDP or income per head is, is 8 or 10 times higher than it is today. So that's an incredibly impressive long-run performance. So how did China grow at such high rates for such a long period of time? Well, the economists um, I won't sort of walk you through all the detail. I'll leave the slides with, with John and you can have a look at this if you're interested. But economists sort of think about economic growth as being about how capable is the economy and how much is that capability growing through time. And you can think about economic growth in a way, in some sense, Karl Marx did 150 years ago. The classical economists thought, if you want economic growth, build another factory. Right, you've got a factory, build another one, that's more output. Um, but also, if you can make it more efficient, that will be helpful in terms of delivering economic growth. That's still largely the way economists think about growth today. More capital, which is like the factories, more people, uh, or more productivity are the three main drivers of long-run economic growth in the economy. China's 10% economic growth has been about 2% growth in the workforce. Uh, so China, until now, has had a growing workforce. Um, it's been about equally, the rest, it's been equally about investment and productivity. Uh, so 4% from, from just having more factories and 4% from more productive. That 4% more product, productivity in China's economy is very unusual. Uh, it's much higher than any other economy anywhere. The reason China has been able to get such high productivity as, as measured is because when those people left the farms in beginning in the 1980s and moved into factories, you don't actually lose much in terms of output as those people leave the farms. But you get a lot more in output because they're making things in factories. Right, so that's measured as productivity, and what an economist would say is you've kind of moved labour around to, to a more efficient part of the economy. Right? So that's the past 30 years. I guess the, the interesting question for me is, okay, what about the next 10 years or 15 years? Now here's an easy question. Demographics. What's happening? Is China going to get 2% growth in the workforce in the next 10 or 20 years? Just yes or no? No? Who votes no? Should all be voting no? One child policy? Right, so China's workforce has just peaked. So the workforce, in fact, grew very quickly and it's now going to fall very quickly. So, in fact, the workforce, as we look over, say, the next 10 years, will be contributing about negative 1% to economic growth. So, having contributed to, it's now going to contribute negative one. That's a three percent drop in economic growth just from demographics. So that brings you down from eight or ten to five to seven already. Before you worry about productivity and worry about capital accumulation. All right. And so what what I would then do is look at those other two factors. Are they going to contribute as strongly to economic growth? in the future as they have done in the past um, the past uh, 20 or 30 years. On the, on the investment side, a lot of economists view China as having over-invested, uh, built too many roads, too many hospitals, or yeah, probably not too many hospitals, too many roads, too much capital, too much construction, too quickly, and that that will be unsustainable going forward. Um, there's different indicators on that. I'm not so sure. It's uh, certainly the case that the investment has, has grown very quickly, but it's still a country where there's a, there's a great need. There's still urbanising. There's a great need for, for apartments and so on in the cities, for better rail, uh, for better uh, infrastructure more broadly, uh, even though it's, it's probably a long way ahead of, say, Jakarta. So I'm not so sure about investment. Productivity, though, I think there is a reason to worry that that will weaken. Um, because 
We've had 20 million people a year moving from, from farms to factories. Probably only 10 million people are going to move for the next 10 years. So halving that number puts a big drag on productivity. Only 10 million people are going to move because there's not so many young people in the countryside anymore. And because um, China's wages are now high. So wage rates in China, minimum wages, are about the same as in Malaysia uh, for a factory work. So it's gone from $100 a month to $700 a month in the last eight years. Uh, huge increase in wages. And so you're not going to build a factory anymore. In fact, uh, who's got an iPhone? Anyone got an iPhone? Some of you. So they're, they're, most of them are made in a factory in Guangzhou by Foxconn, is the company. Foxconn are aiming to have 50,000 robots in their factory in the coming few years. The reason is workers are too expensive in China. Right? So once again, there's an opportunity. Do you build robots and automate, or do you move somewhere cheaper and still use um, human labor to produce goods and services? So there's some really interesting ha things happening in terms of how this all plays out. In terms of the implications for China's economy, add those three things up. Demographics is going to pull 3% off economic growth, and probably productivity another one or two, and you're down to maybe 5% economic growth, which is the sort of sustainable rate of economic growth in the next 10 years, not the 10 or even 7% growth that they've had in the last uh, year or so. So that's a big change for regional economies, and of course is, is why we are now worrying about, about a slowdown in China. Um, and then I'll just point out a couple of the implications of that, and then perhaps uh, throw it open for questions. Here's, and this is probably an interesting one for you to, to look at. This is the demographic structure of China compared with Indonesia. On the left is a, well, demographers would think of it as a typical traditional demographic profile. So down the bottom you've got people aged 0 to 4 and then all the way up to uh, 80 plus is the top one. No one's old in 1960 globally uh, or, or in China. Um, by 2010 China has this unusual profile because of one child policy and also I think there's an effect there of um, the cultural revolution as well. And by 2060, China has this inverted age profile. There won't be young workers to work in factories anymore. Indonesia still has a much more traditional population profile, and even by 2060, it's not that dissimilar to, to China. But certainly for the next 20 or 30 years, the population profile of Indonesia and India and some other regional countries are very different to China. And that creates huge opportunities, and of course, also huge challenges. The, one of the other interesting things about why, what has China been able to get out of its workforce in the last 20 years? It had a growing workforce, but also growing human capital. Right? So the reason you come here. The average number of years of schooling in China's workforce in 1978 was about two years. It's now 10. So that's a dramatic change in the quality just to catch up, not just in terms of the years of education, but the quality of that education um, going forward. Um, and then there's some new merits here on the, on the effect of those labour market changes on economic growth. This is the wages in China, uh, again from the Economist magazine that Indonesia um, average monthly wages in 2010 prices as we speak, are around half of what they are in China. That's why if you're looking, like Levi Strauss, if you're looking to build a new factory, you're looking at this huge wage advantage, but then the question is, do you go to Indonesia or Thailand or Philippines or somewhere else, and you look at things like the um, regulatory environment, the tax environment, all those other things, where Indonesia doesn't score very well in terms of basic ease of doing business. So this is a huge, Opportunity, but a huge um, challenge also for uh, for Indonesia. So a little bit now, I'll leave you with this, the the other slides. I've got some more data here on some of these other things, but I'm going to skip over and talk about the implications for uh, regional economies. Now, here's where I was interested to look at this in the last few days. 
how exposed is Indonesia to a slowdown in, um, in China? This is exports to China as a percentage of the country's GDP. So Chile and its copper to Chile. Chile has 6% of its GDP comprising copper exports to China. Uh, Indonesia is only 2% of its GDP is exports to China. So the direct exposure is, is not that great and compared to other emerging markets, not as exposed to China as, uh, as other markets. So the, the good thing is Indonesia is quite diversified both in terms of country destination and the type of exports relative to many other countries. Uh, I, I, I'd ask you to guess where Australia might be on that map. It's not in there because they were looking at emerging economies. Australia would be there, about 7%. So much more exposed than any emerging economy. We're about there, ahead of Chile. So we're there, our, our export destination is very China focused relative to other countries, which is probably why in Australia we're, we're probably more worried about a slowdown in China than you are here. The other thing that you worry about though again is the sort of indirect effects. So China slows down, people then worry about all emerging markets. Uh, are, are foreigners holding bonds and equities in Indonesia? And this is showing that there is a, a reasonable exposure there in terms of the proportion of the bonds owned by foreigners in Indonesia. So there are all these indirect effects that could be quite strong, even though the direct effects of the China slowdown might be uh, fairly minimal. So let me leave it at that in terms of the presentation. As I say, there's a few slides there I've skipped over that I'm happy to come back to to go into detail on some of those questions. But I guess um, in terms of conclusions, there is no question that China's economic growth rate is slowing down. And so, but, but there's also this huge opportunity created by the demographic shifts and uh, the high, now high wages in China. Uh, but especially in countries like Indonesia, there's an opportunity to take advantage of it. So, So some of the things I go through, at least the main heading that they're all on PowerPoint slides here. Because the copyright part of it, so it's all right. <laughs> so we first looked at the recent global volatility and slowing Chinese growth. So you look at the background of the leading and currency and so on. Then you heard from Prof. Mark about the reforms and the historical narrative, perhaps playing a part, going through the reform area, 79 and so on, and 92 to today. Then you heard about the number three China financial sector. You know, this is almost like a daily taboo. This has been happening over cycles, going from 1,000 to 7,000 back down again. This is been happening. Now, about the future of China's economic growth. Looking at numbers like 8% is going to happen for reasons such as the saturated population, not the really aging population, and so on. You have the comparative analysis of that for Indonesia from Prabhupada. Things like we are a very aging population, a lot of young people, a lot of opportunity. But then again, we have to look at how and what this means for Indonesia. So the China-Indonesia comparison, for example, looking at half of the cost of China, if I hear some part, could mean for us Indonesians here opportunity in terms of what we could do taking advantage of the Chinese situation, if I may say that. The Chinese character for crisis, every word for that, hopefully you know Mark or any other Chinese people, the Chinese character for crisis 
is a combined two character of danger and opportunity. Correct or not? Yes. So if the crisis, which we're talking about here in China, in Chinese language means danger and opportunity, one person's danger is another person's opportunity. So for Indonesia, certainly there might be opportunities if we try to change policies, if we try to make our systems more conducive. You heard from a particular example about Levi and others trying to come in. They could change quite considerably some of the economic situations in Indonesia, which contributes to money in the hand for basic needs. And if I understand from economic policy, when you get money in the hands of the frontline or the basic people, your economy goes up more because the marginal propensity to consume is higher instead of the other people who want to say. Is that correct from a macroeconomic standpoint or it's not quite Probably is, but, but also, I mean, in China, minimum wages have been going, are doubling every five years. So I think Indonesia can achieve that, uh, that would obviously raise living standards very dramatically very, in a very short period of time. So we would have the opportunity of impacting on the economy. And last, we heard from Prof. Mark about the implications for regional economies and what this all means. Also heard about, for Australia, it's a lot heavier compared to Indonesia, he said, and he realized it's that part of the GDP is a part of China. Not so much for Indonesia, about 2% you heard, also Indonesia being a uh, more diverse portfolio of uh, dependencies, but the indirect effect could be it. So what does all this mean to you and me and to Indonesia? And then other questions in what we are about to now get into. So perhaps a round of applause for Prof. Mark for that fantastic <laughs> So it's all to you. I'm going to try and moderate this as best as I can to stop the fights and the debates and things like that. That's my job, yeah? So we have a, we have a question. Uh, sorry, I, I must give you the guest first, you know, Matthew. Sorry, yeah? yeah? So over here, Mark, yeah. for you, the question. Okay. Uh, first of all, great talk. Uh, I, I, first, I have to say, honestly, I don't know a lot about economy. I came to this talk just really out of curiosity. So my apologies if my question is a bit. Simple. Uh, my, it's a two-part question. My, the first part is you told me about the opportunity of uh, grabbing market share because of Chinese increase in wages, uh, and you said Indonesia doesn't really score well in terms of regulatory taxes and all. Because uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you observe socialization uh, economy uh, in, a, in a regular basis. Can you tell me your prediction of? Uh, like our biggest rifle in grabbing that share market that I just really want to know. And second, uh, the opportunity, ri opportunity rises because of the increase in wages in China, which is driven by the economic growth. Uh, so what I would like to say is that this is, this is an absolute thing. So if a country economy grows and uh, the wages go, goes along with it, and uh, it, of course increasing quality of life for the worker force, but then this problem would happen again. or it was there any example of a country that can sustain it and fix this, you know, increase in wages? Thank you. Yeah. So, firstly, in terms of the biggest challenge uh, in the region to Indonesia, uh, I think Vietnam is the obvious one because it has to be another country with a big population because there's a big opportunity. There's, there's tens of millions, I'm not sure of the, off the top of my head right now, but I think it would be in the order of 100 to 100. 50 million people working in factories in China that are, and are going to lose those jobs. Now, the Chinese government knows that, they're aware that there might be a problem. How do they get around that? We have to make sure that workers are more skilled and get better jobs or jobs and services or whatever. And so you, you sort of move out of that, which is what Korea did and Singapore and, and other countries. So that's sort of the answer to your second question as well. You can, you can move out of that by making sure that skills go ahead of wages. And that, again, was the interesting thing in that Wall Street Journal article today. It talked about unit labour costs in, in Indonesia. And unit labour costs is a very simple idea. If wages go up by 10%, but the average worker produces 12% more, then the cost per unit, the labour cost per unit is not actually going up. Right? So you can afford to have higher wages if you have productivity uh, of one form or another uh, keeping up 
And that's what China has had. So the, the Minister for Human Resources. Slides, uh, but when you get, uh, broke down the uh, the three major reasons why you have a sustainable uh, growth of a country, right? You compare labor force and uh, and to others. And I, I, I noticed that uh, mass education, right, is no one of those. So which is not very difficult to. I mean, it's counterintuitive, right? The mass thing that might not have a direct driver of growth. Mass education. So education of oh, yeah. yeah. I sort of kind of count that in labor. So, well, labor, so, so, okay. so labor, you can have a you can have labor contributing to economic growth yes. either because you have more workers or because the workers are more skilled. Oh, okay, okay. So, no, absolutely. My question, my question would be like, a, is that then like an undirect driver or is like a consequence of growth? I think the point about education and skills is that their effect on economic growth in the short run is very small yes. because the, the stock of skills in, in Indonesia is very large, but it's divided across 250 million people and it moves very, very slowly. So it contributes in the next year or two very little to economic growth. But over the next 20 years, if Indonesia can improve education quality in the whole next generation, is able to contribute more to its economic. So it has a long, long effect on economic growth. So can we say it's like a variable uh, driver depending on the state, on the on the level of the growth of the country, right? Because if you need, for example, more manufacturing kind of goods, maybe education still has a relevance. Rather, if you need more like a high degree kind of uh, production, like where it's like in Europe and US, then education is more relevant. Can we also say that? Well, I, I, I think it's relevant in both. You know, it's the question of in higher in the US or Europe, you need you need um, increasingly master's degrees yes. um, to to add to the skills of the economy. Whereas in Indonesia, you just need more people with with top uh, high school and secondary education. So, but I think it's equally important. In fact, actually, I've got one slide up in there. But the US slipping behind other advanced economies in education, especially because the bottom quarter of the education distribution are not getting very good education and their skills are, are actually declining. And so if you test numeracy and literacy of an American or against an Australian or a German or a European, they'll be much lower at that. And in fact, the top end are lower generally as well. So that's a big worry for that economy going forward. Okay, my next question I want to pass on to uh, in the industry or students. And the next two questions I want one from the industry, one from the students before we go on this. Okay, you already have a, uh, I think, probably representing the industry crop. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and students, yeah, this one, you're thinking. <clears throat> go ahead, If I see from your slide, actually, the background economy from <clears throat> the US and the uh, China is, is contradicting Sanghe, right? For example, we, if we see the financial market in China, mostly is uh, consumer retailers. Mm -hmm. If in the US, is more institution, right? For example, in the debt also, in China, mostly the debt is in the manufacturing, but in the US, is more in the wholesale. So, uh, if we heard from the, the Fed uh, when they announced a few days ago, they said another momentum, maybe October and December. Do you think uh, the Fed will increase the interest rate and maybe the China will devaluate <coughs> more further? And then what the people say in Indonesia, if this happen, maybe rupiah will be 20,000. So what is your prediction? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
next oh, time. No. I think the Fed will raise rates. And there's always this question when that happens or before that happens, uh, will that cause the year to, to go back to 11 or 11 and a half uh, quickly? And you, the short answer is you never know. Uh, these things are very difficult to predict. But because that is reasonably well expected that they will raise rates, people are already kind of moving out of the repair and that's why it's so weak now. So you, you wouldn't necessarily expect it to weaken that much more. Same with the Australian dollar, it's, it's gone from a dollar ten cents. Some are saying that it's exactly the same thing in Australia, it'll go to 60 cents very quickly. I, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's already now expected that the Fed will raise rates, they'll raise rates. I'm sure there'll be volatility in the financial markets, but my, my suspicion is it'll be very short-lived. There'll be a few weeks of equity markets, bond markets, currency markets going a bit all over the place. But then we all knew that was going to happen. So why weren't we taking positions already now rather than waiting until it happened? So, so we'll see. But the, the other, I guess the other thing I should say is in financial markets, that is a huge question. And basically people are saying, we don't know what's going to happen when the Fed raises. Therefore, we're scared of it. And that's why I would say, Fed should just do it and get it out of the way and see that probably nothing much will happen. Hopefully. Thank you very much for that question. May I please ask a student next for the next question, and then we'll continue the conversation. Can I have a question from a student? We have somebody already. Very good. Can you please put the mic on and yep. go for it? And then we'll come back to you. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, I'm sorry if this is a little bit of a big question, but what can Indonesia do to kind of secure what China experienced in growth? Like, what is your opinion on that? So, so as, I, as I said, um, Sir Shopkin went to Singapore and looked at what Singapore did to attract businesses. And uh, Singapore was very aggressive in trying to get foreign businesses in. And you might think, well, we want to own our own businesses, which is fine. But when you bring in foreign businesses, you bring in money, you bring in know-how, and, and you bring in jobs. And I guess the hope would then be that you use that money in those jobs to get people better jobs and sort of move up. And I think that's where Indonesia is relative to other countries a difficult place to operate. And, and uh, I was here earlier in the, in the year talking um, at, a, at an economist magazine um, forum and uh, talking about precisely this, how hard it is to do business here and some of the specific reforms that could be introduced to make it easier to do business. And that's everything from tax, making the tax system simpler to uh, just not changing regulations so regularly uh, and those sorts of things. So I, I definitely think it's possible and the government is doing some things well, but probably moving a little bit slow. Just before I uh, pass on to you for the question, one of the things I'm not sure what the current situation is that one of the things I heard is going on in Indonesia is that let's say into the marine policy they have tightened it up even more with the uh, foreign involvement becoming less. Is that your question? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm thinking. I'm going to shut up now. Imagine the coins. You better ask that question. Same no, question. No, 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 no. Is that the same question? No, no. Yeah. So one of the things that I have been reading up. I'm going to do it this way. Probably my voice is louder than mine. <laughs> so, one of the things I've been reading up is that exactly what Mark is talking about, there seems to be an opposite direction some decisions being made. Like the current marine policy, where it used to be foreign vessels and Indonesian vessels operating, is going to be gone, or at least they're trying to leave it, where only Indonesian vessels can go. You can think about a country with 17,000 or whatever the number of islands. If you suddenly make it really restrictive on the Indonesian versus operate, it has a huge economic impact. So I think there's a lot of things that Prof. Mark is pointing out here for us, Indonesia, that we need to make it easier for businesses to operate here. We need to make it easier to attract foreign human capital. And we have to look at that impact in economic growth, and I think that's the main point there. And we, we are seeing some changes in that direction in the government. So, all to you for the question. Can you share the question, I think. Okay, sure. 
Oh, thank you. Actually, my question is more is presentive taking for the students except for us. But anyway, well, I think the students here will be at least like first, second years. First and second years. That's first right. and second years. So in the next trio until five years, and knowing that since this year, 2015, Indonesia also joined the um, regional open economics. So the students nowadays are not only bombarded with the inflation and all of the economic changing, but also with the workforce. So do you have any other suggestions for us, the new workers in the near future? What should we do to join the global market? Thank you. Very good question. That's a very easy one. Study hard. <laughs> <laughs> my, my son uh, went to school in Singapore a couple of years ago, and at the end of it, uh, he said, well, I'm glad we're going back to Melbourne because there's not many people in Melbourne. Uh, and here, of course, Singapore is not that much bigger, but he was thinking about the region, and he now sort of realizes that, that there are tens of millions of people globally that he's, in some way or another, trying to distinguish himself from. Whereas when I was growing up, you know, China was irrelevant to my job prospects <laughs> and uh, the future. Which is again certainly not the truth. Uh, true for all of the students here today. So work hard. Work hard. Yeah, just before I pass to you uh, for the next question, if I may add something from the IPL, one of the things that we constantly talk about in IPL is that it's not enough just to get a piece of paper as a graduation. That we need to be, if I use we are not well-rounded students, well-rounded graduates. That's one of the reasons we hold events like this, mandatory internships mandatory group uh, visits to the industry and a whole lot of things where we try to change the graduates brain through IQ, emotional intelligence through EQ and then creative intelligence as a holistic way of looking at it. So IQ, EQ, CQ has three types of intelligence coming together where the profile of the person can go out there and then go get her, as you say because what matters at the end is not the piece of paper as a graduation but how the university or the institute can I help you get jobs, help you put you in internships. And I'm very happy to say that at ITL, from the first semester, first year onwards, our students go out there to the real world and they come back up. Yeah. Okay.